Okay. So, um, my, name Le my name is Lexi. I am working for IDEF, which is just located around the corner here. And my hobby is anonymous communication, a topic which is widely misunderstood. And I'm here to try to figure one of a few of the stranger subtopics of anonymous communication out for you. Uh, I've seen a couple of people here in the audience who already know large parts of the talks, but there are a couple of new slides in there, so feel free to remain seated. So, um, roughly, what's it all about? So, um, well, why, do you, why do we need anonymous communication? Whom do we need to be afraid of? And so on. But mostly what I want to focus on later on in the talk is, li is the limits. Um, but for primer. So, um, what is anonymity? And you all know what anonymity is. Let's start with a few simple examples. You all know this uh, hero who has two identities. One of its uh, is anonymous, and that's the name of Zorro, which is just a uh, fox in Spanish. And the other one is, uh, uh, I forget his real name. So, um, yeah, but frankly, there are even worse examples of anonymity. There's uh, Clark Kent, whose only disguise is uh, the form of a spectacle, and everybody with a little bit of brain should have recognized that the two identities are the same. Um, well, there are other examples of anonymity in popular literature that you all know, and for Charlie at least, his kind of anonymity works to a certain extent. Um, so the main point why I wanted to start with these three very simple examples is that you keep in mind that anonymity is not just something that you have in the internet, but something that you can have in real life and everywhere too. So, and, and most importantly, all of these topics are connected and, and the similar, and, and the most, most important point is the same. You need to blend into a crowd. If you don't blend into a crowd, you don't get anonymity. And that specifically means you need others. If you're alone, doesn't matter how anonymous you want to be, you are not. Uh, well, you're, you're not anonymous, yeah? Um, if you are in a big crowd, but you just look differently, doesn't matter, you're not anonymous. If that compared to the internet, for example, if you have a different web browser than everybody else, and you use an anonymity system, doesn't matter, you're still, everybody will recognize you. Um, you need to behave like all the others. Otherwise, you're not anonymous. Um, taken to the internet, if everybody is using Tor for, using, for surfing web pages and you're the only one using it for BitTorrent, you're not anonymous. Forget it. And first of all, you must not be suspicious anyway. Because if you're the only one who knows something and, for example, somebody kicked you in your private parts and you post an evil blog, comment on your blog, or better, in his blog, using Tor with regards to this feature. Well, you're the only one who knew about it, so it doesn't matter if you hide your IP. You were the one, and you certainly get kicked a second time. <laughs> so, um, before we start to like, take a look at the actual networks, um, the most important th part you always have to think before you choose your network is whom are you actually afraid of? Can we get a few examples from our audience? Whom are you afraid of? Why would you want to choose Tor? Anybody? The content mafia. The content mafia. That's a good example. Other examples? The authority in general. The authority in general. Okay. So, let's see. Um, the principal point is that basically people choose to have a couple of attackers that they are afraid of, which have really not so much in common with what they should actually fear of. Um, so, there are more, even more examples of um, computer threats which are commonly misunderstood. But still, well, knowing your attacker is critical. If you don't know who you are afraid of, then first you choose the wrong defense models. And choosing the wrong defense models means you still have no defense. Doesn't matter. 
Then if you choose too strong attacker models like, well, all the people who are afraid from aliens or secret services or whatever, um, they just stop their daily life just to keep all of their defense on, which is unnecessary anyway. So let's see, uh, who are snoopers to worry about? Uh, there is this nice girl Alice on the left side and this ugly guy Bob on the right side and they want to communicate in a certain way. So um, the first thing, and if that fails, you really have to worry, is if there is some external party somewhere at the other side of the globe who takes notice from the act of communication, then you certainly have trouble. Um, examples are uh, public Facebook postings or something like that. I mean, obviously you can't. Um, communicate privately using those, but still, I mean, it's a good test. If you fail that one, I'm really sorry. Um, the next thing, and that, for example, is usually one of those already with the content mafia, is um, the service provider. If you communicate with somebody and you don't trust him, then you really are in a problem. And in the part with the, of the content mafia, that's, for example, fake BitTorrent clients in there trying to get content from you and you don't know them or offering you content under a false identity. The next serious thing to think, talk, um, the next serious attacker to talk about is the local administration. He's also one of the most powerful because usually the local administration controls all of you. All of your network access can modify a lot of data. After that, if you got care of them, start thinking of the ISP. Then if you manage to talk about the ISP, then take care about, well, if you're still interested then, you can continue with trying to defend yourself about the gov government or even secret services. So, um, I can back up all of these claims, um, but we're a little bit short of time, so I have to continue. If you got questions to those, mostly a recommendation, um, feel free to contact me later on. So let's get into the networks. So finally you want to talk um, anonymous to somebody else. Um, there's actually no reason to use Tor. Mostly not. Um, for most attackers, single hop proxies are fully sufficient and they don't really make your life a mess. Um, as, as we he see here, um, if Alice wants to talk to Bob, a single hop proxy is fully enough if her attackers in this case are Emily and Bob. Um, single hop proxies are something like web anonymizers, any open proxies, um, misconfigured Apache servers, botnets, whatever, you can find them easily. So the big point is that if you just care about your communication partner or some other government at the other end of the world, just please use um, single hop proxies. They make your life easier. You don't get, take all the bandwidth from the Tor people if you just uh, want to use BitTorrent. Um, they are cheap and for free, easy to use and there are no single point of failure. Um, of course, they have disadvantages. One of the biggest disadvantages of a single hop proxy is that you have no actual protection against global attackers. We'll come to that later. Also, you do not have protection against the proxy. So the proxy being the person who takes your data and forwards it. But then usually, I mean, as long as you don't do anything illegal, who cares about the proxy? I mean, as long as it's not really in your Ethica model, who cares, really? Um, the same for Elizabeth or local administrators. Just take a deep thought, are they in your Ethica model or not? If not, okay, single proxy, otherwise we can get, get to it. Um, Finally, the biggest disadvantage is that if we talk about people in China or something and they only have a single proxy, availability is really an issue. But at least for those people in the semi-free world here, um, that usually does not apply. 
So uh, let's get to onion routing. Um, the big hammer which solves all your problems. Um, is it known to everybody? I guess I should explain it a little bit. Just for those um, who maybe have read the novel Little Brother or others where it's described falsely. Um, by the way, a, le a le lecture which I heartily recommend. It's uh, a book from Corey, I forgot his last name. Name is Little Brother. Hmm? Yeah, Corey Doctorov. So, um, how does Tor work? Basically, instead of a single proxy, you take three. And, of course, you want to avoid that any single proxy can read the data or can see that, you, that Alice communicates to Bob. So what you do is you introduce a lot of cryptography. So Alice first took, talks to the first proxy, establishes cryptographic measures, then uses the first to talk to the second one, establishes cryptographic measures, uses the second to talk to the third one, establishes cryptographic measures, talks to Bob. Um, this means that usually the first and the second proxy have no clue whom you are talking to. The second proxy doesn't know who you are, neither who you are talking to. The third proxy doesn't know who you are, doesn't even know the first proxy you've been using, just knows there's somebody who's talking to Bob. Um, same applies to Elizabeth, okay, she sees you're talking something, but just to the first proxy, it's everything encrypted, no chance, Evelyn nothing, Emily nothing, you're really safe. Are you? Well, yeah, you're safe, but you're not safe against Eve, and all the thing is very expensive. All the nice bandwidth that, you, that we have all the nice things that we use, they all become invalid because web pages load like minutes. And um, I'll tell a little bit later on about it, but JavaScript and Flash, you can basically forget about them. So all the nice web surfing doesn't work anymore. Um, so this is one of the trade-offs you have to do. If you start using Tor, everything gets worse. So the web surfing experience gets worse, the bandwidth gets worse, and um, yeah. But as I said, you just have to, to check which is your actual active attacker model you want to defend against. So maybe you don't need it. Um, onion routing, for those who are in need, comes in different flavors. There's Tor. There was a very nice uh, talk from a friend of mine, Jens, on the first day of SIGIN, for those of you have, who have intended, attended the talk, um, he showed a few features of it. Um, there's another thing called either Anom or Genonym or Jab. Um, it comes, again, in two sub-flavors, a free one and a commercial one. If you use the commercial one, your anonymity set goes down because you're one of the few people on Earth who actually pay for your traffic. Um, on the other hand, you'll get big bandwidth. Um, then there is I2P, which is a largely unknown project, but works quite fine. And there's Mixmaster of those of, for those of you who are willing to wait a, a few days for an email to arrive um, with a probability of 50%, but you may, but you may retransmit after a week. Um, still offering the biggest protection on the earth against aliens and secret services and, well, basically everybody. So, let's come to the actual point. Now, given you know whom you need to defend your privacy against, and given that you actually have chosen the network of your preferences, um, you just install Tor, you set up a proxy, and you're safe. Are you? What could happen to you? I mean, you are in disguise. Nobody knows your IP address. You're perfectly safe. You leave fingerprint... It's fine, I'll repeat. 
So you leave fingerprints of your browser. Yeah, and that's exactly that, because what is anonymous communication about? It's just the communication layer. And for those of you freaks who l know the TCP IP stack or general ISO OCI stack, um, communication layer is just a tiny, tiny part of all the communication taking place. So it all starts with fingerprinting. It doesn't matter what kind of anonymity network you use. Uh, to a certain extent, the size of the packets and the number of frames transmitted will still be visible to anybody along the route. This means that if you start communicate to google.com, then you will generate this, ki this kind of fingerprint within the first few seconds. Regardless whether you, you surf and plane over Tor, it will be a little bit distorted. You use Yap, doesn't matter. This is the fingerprint. And you can go along and make this fingerprint for every web page out there. This means that if you are along the route of anybody communicating anonymously, uh, and you'll see one of those fingerprints, you know who is his communication partner. Um, while this attack is widely regarded quite inefficient, um, I know a few researchers who have managed to get a hit rate of 80% on the Tor network in the wild with this attack. I uh, don't know whether this is already public or not, but well, this is, now it's public anyway. So, um, yeah. Then the next problem we have are exit nodes. Um, your traffic is encrypted within the anonymous network. We got that. Um, but I also said that anonymizers only protect your IP address. This means that the content is not encrypted. Well, it is, well, it is encrypted within the network, but once it leaves, it's in plain. Because, well, if I surf on eBay or something, I do not get eBay to offer HTTPS for everything. So usually, like, I would guess 98% of all the web pages or something out there, all they offer is plain HTTP. This means that no, Tor does not magically encrypt all the internet. Once my traffic leaves Tor, um, it's unencrypted, and this means it's usually also not integrity protected. So the last node in the network can sniff and modify the traffic. Um, now, is this really a problem? Because, I mean, in the internet, we already have sniffing nodes. And we know about plane traffic. Why is it a big problem that Tor nodes can do that? Because when I use my home DSL subscriber line, I usually communicate in plane too. The big problem is that normal traffic is usually relayed by professional people. If I transmit my normal HTTP request from my home address to eBay, it goes along a line of professional people who get paid money and whom I can kick their ass if something happens. Anonymous traffic is relayed by any type of people. Once I set up an exit node, I myself can sniff and modify the traffic of arbitrary people. Now go and guess um, who can set up also anonymous exit nodes. I mean, you, of course, and then you got the power to sniff and modify the traffic of everybody using Tor. Fine thing. Well, fortunately, the Tor project has a few of pro sub-projects running to try to um, at least provide protection against modifying traffic, but still sniffing traffic is open. And there are a few attacks in the past where Credentials to social websites have been supposed to be sniffed, uh, credentials to email boxes, whatever. I mean, everything that's sent in plain can be grabbed. Um, yeah. And so the funny thing is that once you start running an exit node and start sniffing the exit traffic, usually people use anonym anonymizers only for the sensitive, tra sensitive traffic. So you don't need to care to wipe out all the boring parts because all the boring parts have been sent plain without Tor. Basically, that means you get all the funny stuff without the need to filter. So, well, then, yeah, 
setup tour. Setup tour means um, there's this funny thing usually that if you recommend tour or yap or whatever to some person in need of anonymous communication, then the person comes to you a week later and says, yeah, it's great, I installed Tor, I feel so much more comfortable. And most interesting, my surfing speed hasn't delimited. Then you can just instantly tell the person, wait, did you configure your browser to use Tor as a proxy? And then the person will ask you, proxy? What's a proxy? Um, so even if they manage to find this uh, proxy thing and the, the proxy configuration thing and you misconfigure the proxy because Tor by itself usually offers only a SOX proxy then you should know that SOX proxy do not resolve DNS requests. This means that all the H uh, TCP connections they run over Tor but all the IP lookups run in plain so that the person running the DNS server, the DNS relay, or the local administrator simply take a look at your DNS resolves and then know where your anonymized TCP connection goes to. Um, the next thing is that Flash and Java applets possibly circumvent this proxy settings. If you have a web page that has a Java applet, there's the same origin policy, so Java applets can just make a plain TCP connection back to the web server. Same origin is fine, but this TCP connection comes from Java, so it's not subject to the Firefox proxy settings. Bypasses Tor, bam, plain IP address. Same to Flash. Um, by the way, just this third point has already been proven to be able to de-anonymize more than 90% of all the Tor users. Um, then may maybe you can see it right there, I highlighted the, the HTTP proxy. If you set the HTTP proxy, take care that you also set the SSL proxy, otherwise just a simple reference from the web page containing an, an HTTPS link already identifies you, and even if you set the SSL proxy, you can just include images on a web page using FTP scheme, which bypasses the SSL proxy, so you need to set the FTP proxy too. I uh, haven't tried with Gopher, but I leave that as an exercise to you. So, now, um, the funny thing is about a browser, um, it's a modern operating system, so it has tons of features which you probably know, but you never have thought about that they might risk your privacy. I heartily recommend you try it first alone to dare visit the web page didyouwatchporn.com. And if you know how to use all the privacy features, you will see this nice picture. Otherwise, you will not. Um, <laughs> Now, I'll tell you how it works. Have you ever noticed that once you visited a link on a web page, it becomes a different color? Everybody's seen this. Now, what this web page does, it, is it has a list of like 100,000 porn websites. It loads it somewhere in the background in iVisible iframes, just displays the link and checks if the color changes. If one of the colors of the links changes, it knows that you've watched porn. Um, the scheme is general. It's not just applicable to porn. You can use it to identify the real names of people. This is a proof of concept done by a research group from Vienna and the Ruhr University of Bochum. I don't know, somebody of those here? I think Thorsten had a talk, had a talk here. Um, what they use is they try the same scheme on the Xing groups and then they guess that if you visited a Xing group then you must usually be a member of it. Then if you just take the intersection of all the Xing groups that you visited, they got your real name and it works surprisingly well. Uh, so if you're a member of Xing, just try this link above there um, and you'll see how good it works. Again, doesn't matter if you use Tor. Just 
JavaScript enabled, and there you are. Um, browsers themselves are fairly unique. Um, here's some nice statistics collected by the well-known EFF, who says that if I connect to some web page, and they see this uh, HTTP request. I split it, uh, marked a few of things there, like, like refer accepted encodings, languages, software versions, um, operating system. Um, what I didn't show there is the order of, of the lines, like is host field the first one, is user agent the second one, is also dependent on the browser. So this is why faking the browser agent basically is, is no matter. Still, your, the fake browser agent will be transmitted, but the order of the HTTP headers will be the same. So this just puts you in front of all the others, like, hey, look, there's a lame guy faking his browser agent. Um, if you just take these data available in a single HTTP request, you get that from the statistics from the EFF that 85% of all the browsers have a unique fingerprint meaning like unique within a set of one million samples. Um, if you have Flash and JavaScript enabled, um, the web page extracts some more data, like your screen resolution, your installed fonts, um, your installed plugins, and I don't know what else more. Um, bringing basically just the browser itself to an identifiability of more than 99% within a test sample of, of one million browsers. So again, come on, you store, I don't care. Once I've seen your browser agent in plain, I know who you are. Yeah. Coming to the do it the right way. So what's remaining? Yeah. Um, we can use an internet cafe because they have a different browser. They don't know me. And I just pay in plain, surf and leave. Okay, but what if we are a little bit too lazy to walk to an internet cafe from, on a daily basis because sooner or later they will know us? Then the only thing remaining is that we install a virtual machine with a dedicated browser on there where everything goes to Tor and we must never, never, ever use this browser for anything else but for our other second identity. Otherwise, they might get linked. So, just to get to an intermediary conclusion, just imagine this is you without Tor. Yeah? Now, let me switch to you with Tor. See the, see the difference? Turn back. You without Tor, you with Tor. Um, yeah, I guess this picture shall summarize to, to a certain extent that exchanging the IP address is just a tiny, tiny little bit. And unless you really know what, you, what you're doing, please use Tor with caution. And please do not use it for any illegal purpose because all the top people really do a lot of work to bring anonymity to those who need and not, not, and not to those who, well, who just take it there because it's fun. Um, I see I, I, that I'm a little bit early. I got a few esoteric things about anonymity. But because I know that there usually are a few sec uh, questions about um, anonymity and real life and stuff, I really like to take questions first before going to the esoteric stuff. Um, so, other questions? Um, is this on? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what about using live CDs for that kind of stuff? Um, I mean, isn't... I, I mean, yeah, screen resolution, stuff like that is always the same on my computer, but is the, the number of people high enough that I can submerge in the big group? Um, I repeat, the question is, is it okay to use a live CD to gain anonymity? 
apart from the obvious fact that I still use my ISP and my yeah. usual internet connection. So I would say for most purposes using a, a live CD is fine. I, I haven't tried using a live CD and then check how unique the browser is. But uh, you always have to, have to keep in mind that being anonymous means blending into a, into a crowd. And the fact that you yourself are able to use a live CD puts you on top of 99% of all the other internet users. So that if I see in my web log there's an access from somebody using a browser which is like uh, six months old because live CD may be not updated, um, and it's anyway a, a browser from a Linux distribution, I can guess that it's uh, somebody from with a technical background able to use a live CD. That's okay, but then what you forget is you're not into the 99% crowd of all the other internet users. Well, I, I, just one more uh, remark. The, of course, it depends on what you want to achieve. If you have a, a Windows install for your primary identity, let's turn it that way, and then you use a live CD for your, well, funny private life, um, that's fine, because then you've got two identities who are quite contrary. On the other side, if your primary surfing really is from Linux, then maybe you're more anonymous if you install uh, Windows XP and use an old internet uh, six browser or something for surfing because then you blend into the big majority crowd of, of I don't know, 60, 70 percent of internet users. And the big point here is that if you do not want to use Tor but just want to be anonymous, you just need to have a second identity that is not linkable to your prime identity. And then using Tor is fine, that's, that's like an add-on or something. But that's a good approach. More questions? Uh, you, you just answered my question. Okay, that's good. More questions? Uh, you mentioned Mixmaster on the first yeah. or on some slide. Um, I've heard a talk at the Congress about a year ago, I think, about the Mix Minion project. Mm -hmm. Can you say anything about that? compared to Mixmaster? Yeah, the Mix Minion is the follow-up project from Mixmaster. Uh, to me, they are basically the same. There are a few academic differences. Um, I would say mostly um, both of the projects are academical. So if, if you want real anonymity, I don't know, either you're really most paranoid person on earth or you just use any other anonymous network and use plain, simple web, mail, whatever. Just use Tor, log into Yahoo, something, create anonymous email address under a fake identity um, which will give you more protection than using Mixmaster. Or at least more usability combined with an adequate protection than Mixmaster. Because Mixmaster and Mixminion, they are designed to protect against a global adversary. That means somebody who's capable to observe the complete internet. Now imagine, uh, do you know anybody who really has an eye on you and who's capable of watching the complete internet? So case one, you don't know anybody, or at least if you know somebody who's capable of doing that and you're not on the target list, there's no point in using Mixmaster. Of course, you can feel free to send an email through Mixmaster from time to time just in case to help the poor guys who really think that Mixmaster is, is the thing and be one of the dummies that, that offers them, them the crowd. Um, but then think there is a person who's capable or an entity to observe the 
complete internet and who you are on the target list, then don't you think they got better means to trace you down, observe your communication, than observing the complete internet? I mean, they could come to your home, install a tiny, tiny spy camera, they could trace you, they could trace your mobile, they could plant a Trojan horse on your computer, whatever. All of these measures are by way more efficient than observing the complete internet. Um, and if all of those measures don't work, they use the XKCD approach and come to you with a $5 wrench and beat the heck out of you. Well, but maybe I want to communicate with someone I can suspect being under that kind of surveillance and they don't have me on the radar but the other communication partner. If it's their paranoia, then... Yeah. See, the funny thing with Mixmaster is it does not provide a back channel. You can just communicate forward through it. Yeah? So, so if there's somebody, well, I don't know, just send him a plain email address to his fake email account he needs to have because, I mean, otherwise there's no way of communicating with him. There's alt anonymous messages, but, well, yeah. it's getting academic here, yes. No, it's getting point of one of those esoteric things I got in the latest slides. <laughs> More questions? Uh, I was just wondering if you have any suggestions for VOIP. For? For VoIP. Um, yeah. Uh, my suggestion would be uh, buy a used prepaid card, buy a used phone, um, don't put another SIM card into the phone and there it's... Uh, um, for voice over IP, the problem is, um, maybe you remember the slide where I showed the disadvantages of Tor and there was the snail on there. Um, can you imagine to use voice over IP over TCP um, with an average bandwidth of, I don't know, like four kilobytes or something and the connection coming down like every two minutes? It's really a funny telephone you will have. Um, okay, I, I can still mention there are a few research prototypes. Um, there was one research prototype called Vodka, which really made brutal use of Tor, like uh, deploying multiple circuits, uh, sending every voice of IP message like 10 times or something through Tor, making abundant use of the resources um, just to get to an anonymous call, but I would not recommend using this to, to anybody because that's a, a research prototype. And then we already had traffic patterns. The traffic pattern of this brutal usage of Tor would be definitely significantly different than all the other traffic in Tor, again, which would not lead to any kind of anonymity. So unless there is a network which a dedicated purpose of having anonymous voice over IP communication, I would not recommend having anonymous voice over IP communication to anybody. Just use plain old GSM. You get away cheaper and you know the dangers by yourself. Um, it seems to me that many of the examples you, you, you used there quite clear that one of their main problems is that just by using any privacy enhancing technology you're already sort of waving to anybody looking at, you know hey I'm a person who cares about privacy which sort of makes you stand out in the first percentile yeah so, you're right so my question would be how can we get everybody else to start driving a black Lexus and then disappear in the crowd yeah see the big point is um, you're completely right, anonymity loves company. And if anybody of you has a spare bandwidth, spare CPU cycles, um, spare servers, feel free to donate to any of these open projects like Tor, uh, I2P or whatever. Um, the other side of the medal is that if you use Tor, you use like 
five times the bandwidth you use normally, um, and you use like, I don't know, maybe a hundred times the CPU cycles you use normally. Now imagine like everybody using five times the amount of bandwidth and hundred times the amount of CPU cycles. Uh, I would say we have quite nice networks today, but they are just not there for the majority of people. Um, but as I said, you're completely right. Just using anonymity networks already is a sign that you have something to hide. Um, if you may lend the people who are in desperate need of anonymity a hand, just feel free to use Tor for your everyday browsing. Um, that might give them some more cover. Um, other than that, um, all these anonymity projects are research, research projects. And if you start Tor, it still should display a message telling you that you should not use it for strong anonymity. The same applies to every other project. Um, if you are in real need of anonymity and you are know that you are being watched, um, then you should find an individual measure to gain this anonymity you strive for. So, so, yeah, I hope that answers your questions. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, there's, there's no other nice uh, question, uh, neither answer. Yeah, you talked about um, browsers a lot, but um, a lot of people do things which they don't, don't want to share with uh, the content mafia on BitTorrent. Can you distinguish different BitTorrent clients by monitoring the traffic, or is there su such, su such a thing? Like, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I tried to include an email from Roger on the Tor mailing list. I don't know which BitTorrent client it is, but one of the BitTorrent clients includes your real IP address and the traffic to be anonymized. So you definitely can identify that one and it identifies yourself anyway. Um, so I don't know about the other ones. Um, yeah. I, d I don't know. I, I would guess there is no real way to distinguish BitTorrent clients, but then, yeah, I mean, doing BitTorrent over Tor is stupid anyway. Yeah, but, but it's not about Tor. I mean, you could do it over a single op proxy or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, same problems apply. I mean, regardless of the anonymity stuff you do, um, there's no need to, to identify. Ah, okay. No, I got your question, sorry. Um, I don't know. Subject to open research. Are you still in looking for a master thesis? Uh, yeah, uh, kind of. <laughs> yeah, come to me after the talk. Okay, cool. <laughs> okay, more questions? Okay, then um, let's take another five minutes or so to get to the more esoteric examples of how to achieve real anonymity with really, well, some funny things. We already got mentioned um, alt anonymous messages. So if you really are in need with communicating, to communicate with somebody who's got paranoia, then there's this Usenet group and there is, well, you can use Mixmaster to post to this group. Of course, you need to take care that your messages arrive. So, as I said, resend every few days until they arrive. Um, you can mes send messages there, PGP encrypted. You should turn off implicit addressing. As you know, if you encrypt a message with PGP, the message header contains an identifier to whom you encrypted the message. So if you leave that on, everybody knows to whom this message is directed. So if you post to this group, remove it, and there you got a quite fine anonymous system. Just post there. Um, you yourself, of course, if you want to get an answer, read all the messages from, from the Usenet decrypted, or at least try to decrypt, because they got no implicit addressing there. And um, if you're really advanced, you can use this group even as a back channel for limited web surfing because there are a few servers out there in the internet 
whom you can send an email address with a URL and they post the result to a Usenet group. <laughs> so if you don't fear latencies of hours to days, and if you want paranoid web surfing, this is your method. <laughs> um, of course, if you are into alien paranoia or something, there are number stations uh, installed during Cold War. These are shortwave radio systems with um, speech synthesis generated numbers. And um, they are deployed at some places within the USR or whatever not. I'm unfortunately not a radio amateur, so I cannot locate them myself. But they have the best possible recipient anonymity. As I said, anonymity is about the size of the anonymity set. So everybody on the planet can receive these messages. So anybody who is capable to get access to a shortwave radio is a possible recipient. So best maximum um, yeah, implementation of an anonymity system. Of course, installing it is... Yeah. Yeah, the good thing is, uh, I just repeat, um, yeah, having shortwave radio systems is not as common was, was the command. Yeah, but the point is you can still buy one cache and have it home without anybody noticing that you have it or that you receive it. So, yeah. Um, of course, trying to send shortwave is a little bit suspicious. Um, yeah. But on the other hand, you can use them for coordinating anything you want. So you can agree with somebody in private that you are both listening to the same shortwave radio system. And if a specific series of number appears, then you're both doing the same thing. Of course, that can mean like waiting for years, but still, I mean, it's a good measure to, to coordinate things. Yeah. And finally, my favorite is uh, the use of steganography. Um, mostly recommended to the boys in the audience. If you got some message to send, just put it in a pornographic image and post it somewhere in the internet. Um, millions of people will download it. Um, also the, recip the intended recipient, and even if the intended recipient gets caught and gets asked, come on, what's this image? We, all we have seen that you have downloaded it. He has plausible deniability that he did not read the message, but used it for other obvious purposes. <laughs> um, so, well, basically, if you want to hunt anonymous messages, you can start up a research project, get funding for the European Union, and crawl all the binary pictures erotica message message groups for steganography. Um, if you try to get money for such a project, contact me. I'm willing to join the project. <laughs> yeah. So basically, that's it for me. If there are no more questions, I release to the next speaker. Um, but for the last example, I needed to create my own pornography because uh, everybody would be able to see the difference between the picture that was posted on some other source before. So Yeah, <laughs> you're a handsome young guy. <laughs> 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 okay, thanks. And enjoy the um, yeah the rest during yeah an upcoming is a panel. <laughs>